I was exactly where I wanted to be. And yet, there was something going on in my head and in my heart that said, there's something amiss. There is something wrong here. And you need to pay attention to it. And again, I, I honestly, Charles, I don't think I did until, until I got started on this process, you know, even, even after I quit, because I, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't let myself think about a lot of these things and, and about the fact that I was perhaps unhappy in my dream job. I did not let myself think about it until that final straw that happened on one day in August in 2012, where I said, enough, I am not going to take this anymore. And um, so it's not like I had even planned it. It's, and, I, and I certainly had not listened to those little gremlins in my head that were saying, uh, Tess, you are not happy on Sunday night. You are not looking forward to going into your workplace for X, Y, and Z, even though you love the job itself. And so, you know, I would, I would say to people that um, it, it's very hard to listen to those voices and it's, it's much easier to just push that fear down and down and down and down and down. But I think it would be healthier to do it not the way I did it. and actually start listening to yourself. And again, th that is a huge challenge. It is a gigantic challenge just to listen to yourself, listen to your body, listen to your heart, and make a very difficult change, especially one that from the outside looks bonkers. Oh, well, that's the truth. Um, but, I mean, right? I mean, that that's the thing. It's Absolutely. People, people think that everything is going so great in your life. And it's, oh boy, especially with social media these days, you know, I mean, it's the whole, yeah. everybody's life is great except mine. I mean, look at what they're putting on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Well, it's not true and it's not real. Our facade book. Our facade book. <laughs> I like that. I've not heard that before. Um, so, you know, just, so I would encourage people to uh, do as I say and not as I did. Of course. And start to pay attention to those little voices uh, way ahead of when I did. And you'll find that I think uh, then you're able to get yourself to a place where you are, you know, you, you don't want to get to the point where you are quitting something in anger. Uh, you want to make a, you want to make a concerted choice and you want to have thought about some of the things that I didn't end up thinking about until, you know, six, six, 12, 18, 24 months into this process as to, you know, how I could have how I could have prepared better, how I could have handled it better in the lead up to making this decision. It seems as you're talking about that, a huge stress that a lot of people that I've that I know that I've talked with and that I've experienced is looking at back at what what's been invested. You've got a, a great quote by Thoreau, never look back unless you're planning to go that way. <laughs> and I think of that in terms of the sunk costs that you talk about. Right. Uh, once once an investment's been made, then uh, I I can't let go of that. Do you want to talk briefly about some of that that's come up for you and others? Yeah, so this is a concept that, um, so just for some background for people who don't know me, and there are lots of people who don't, um, I spent 11 years at this program called Marketplace, which is a public radio, a national public radio uh, business and economics program. I was there for almost a dozen years. And so I was immersed in in finance and in numbers, which is hilarious because I am, I am terrible at finance, but this was, you know, that that was kind of the point of the show. They hired people without high finance backgrounds so that you would ask the stupid questions and be able to translate it for an audience that also did was not a bunch of insiders. Yeah, absolutely. So um, six of those years uh, that I did were, were spent in personal finance. And one of the psychological pretexts that you that we talk about in personal finance is this notion of the sunk cost fallacy. And what this talks about is investors in a stock who will hold on to that stock even as it is plummeting because they have spent so much time and energy gathering it, gathering up all the shares of that stock that they have. So there's this there's this psychological thing that's happening where they're saying, but wait a minute, I spent the last five years, I spent the last 10 years, you know, investing in, say, Apple. And all of a sudden today, 
the stock is dropping like a rock, which I can't imagine actually ever happening, but you know, so, 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 so you're holding on to that Apple stock and just, you're just telling yourself it's going to come back. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. Even when it goes to a penny stock, and you're not willing to give it up because you spent, you sank so much of, of yourself and your money and your effort and your research into that stock that you cannot bring yourself to get out of it. That's the sunk cost fallacy. And the way we apply it here is the whole, the, the whole idea, the whole notion that you've, especially if you've been doing one thing for a very long time uh, and you've went to school for it and you trained for it and you, th you know, that's, that's all the experience you have. Um, maybe we've even taken extra classes for it. You've traveled for it. So you have spent all this time sinking yourself into this career and you have sunk so much cost, whether that's energy cost, whether that's actual dollar cost, whether it's time away from your family cost, you have spent all these years sinking so much into this career that even when it is dropping out from the bottom of you, you cannot get out. You cannot convince yourself that it would be worth it to essentially, to your mind, throw away those 10, 20 years of experience or whatever it is and start something new. Right. Even though you're not really throwing anything away, you can't. There is no way that you can just forget everything that you've ever learned. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite images uh, that one of the one of my interviewees had was it was this was Carl Seidman, uh, a businessman in Chicago who quit his job, uh, not once, not twice, but I think three times. Good for him. <laughs> and went on what, yeah, and went on what he called his first and second retirements, which I just I love that idea. But he talked about you know the when when it comes to this idea that somehow when you leave, you are engaging in this you you are you are leaving all of those sunk costs that you had he, he says look put your resume in a drawer just put your resume in a drawer and leave it there for a year go back a year later and pull it out what has changed nothing absolutely nothing that's good and so i think what that tells us is you know first of all uh, this idea that you can't take a break, that you can't take some sort of gap is in, just stupid. And I've, I'm, on a, I'm on a big kick now to try to get human resources people to, to get off this notion that you can't take time away from your career um, because it'll blackball you for the rest of it. Um, but to, to, to tie it a little bit more to what we were just talking about, this sunk cost thing, you know, you... Even if you do end up going and doing something different, you carry with you for the rest of your life, for the rest of whatever career you might jump into, all of those skills that you gained over that first career lifetime. You don't lose that. You don't all of a sudden fall down and hit your head and forget everything that you've learned. It's accumulated knowledge. It is all accumulated knowledge. Exactly. And so, you know, that's when you think about this notion of, oh, I, you know, I, I just can't, I can't leave my law job because I sank so much into it and here I am and I'm about to make partner and, and how could I possibly leave right now? Well, it's all a matter of figuring out what your priority is. You know, is your priority to make partner in a law firm or in a career that you're really not interested in anymore? Or is your priority to have a, a full and joyous life? Um, and, you know, all, you may not utilize those skills in the same way that you've always had. You know, all those skills that you have that sunk cost in. But they will come into play in some way down the line. And you just, you have to believe that and, and not stick around in something just because it's what's expected of you and just because you have X many years in what you've been doing. It's not worth it. One of the areas that I, it seems to me that people sink a lot of themselves into is school. They go to college, they get a degree, and then they get out in the world and find, 
I don't even like this. And I've been an advocate of, of apprenticeships for all of my career, encouraging people to, well, as you say, say in your, your book, why don't we try on the work we'll do all day before we commit to it? Right. Is to get people to, to try something. But then even as adults, after they're, they're going through a change, they'll often say, well, I need to go back to school. I think, well, why don't you just take that money and live on it for a little while and work with someone and find out if that's really what you want to do again? Didn't you learn this the first time through? Right. Right. Yeah. No, it's it. I mean, it's one thing that I, I really encourage people to do. And this is something that I learned from a researcher over in France. Her name is Herminia Ibarra. And, you know, she talks about how it's really important to, you know, we, we all hear, but I hate the word networking. I really do. I just, it's, it's so overused now and it's, it gives you promise that I don't think is there. Um, and th this is the whole, whole idea that, you know, go and have a coffee with somebody. Um, she says, no, actually go a few steps beyond that. If you are thinking about making a leap into something uh, that you don't necessarily have training for, she says, spend some actual quality time with someone who is in that career who is in that specialty um we all i think are very shy and feel like we would be imposing if we asked a friend or a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend uh to spend a day or two essentially shadowing them at work this is when you're really thinking about making a significant change from from what you did previously um she says you know it's 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 very different just to go to coffee with someone versus going into the workplace and seeing what their work life balance is, seeing what they do on a daily basis, seeing who their colleagues are, seeing you know what kind of work culture they have, um, and you know it's it's not something that's that is I guess easy to ask people to do, um, but I think a lot of us are more open to doing this to to inviting people to come in and and see and spend time with us in our workplaces. I think I think people will be more open than we expect them to. And maybe if enough people started asking for that, uh, it would become the norm. I certainly would like to think that if I went back into a newsroom uh, and had a full time job there and somebody came to me and said, look, I have I have this idea that I, I've, I've always wanted to be a journalist and I would love to come spend a couple of days with you that I would say, sure, come and see how actually not sexy it is. <laughs> it's not nearly as exciting as everybody thinks that it's going to be. That's the important um, so that's, part. I, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's something that that we should be open to as people being asked of this. Uh, and it's something that, you know, you should uh, pursue and try. Um, I have one story in the book uh, of a woman who spent most of her career in corporate life and then was just, just couldn't do it anymore. And even though, you know, she was making great money and she had a great title and she, but she was just burned out and she did not know what she wanted to do next. This is uh, Christy Momerick in, uh, in Minnesota. And she saw an advertisement for an associate baker at one of the local, you know, beautiful bakeries. Um, and she walked in one day and said, look, uh, I don't know anything about baking. I know nothing about baking, but I love eating it. And I would love to learn this new skill if you would be willing to teach me. And the, you know, guy who owned the bakery said, you know what? I'm going to teach you. I think it's great that you walked in here and clearly you're ready to learn and clearly you have an idea of what you, what you want to get out of this. So let's do it. That's incredible. And she, yes, yeah, she became, she became a baker of all things, you know, and I love that story because she, you know, she also told me that, that it was hard for her uh, mentally and emotionally because she felt there was this part of her that felt like she was disappointing people. There was this part of her that felt like, you know, oh, I had this great education and you know i had this long career and again this this the whole sunk cost thing and and now here i am and i'm i'm just a baker which first of all there's nothing remotely wrong with that it's a perfectly wonderful uh career 
You're not, and again, it sounds denigrating. You're just a something instead of exactly, you are exactly. that and embrace it. Yes. Yes. 